All right. Good morning, Joe. Nice to see you. Are you well? Good morning. Very good. Thank you. How are you? Very well indeed. Thanks. I'm going to put you up first, if that's okay. So I'm just about to go into this thing. Here. Nothing like a wee bit of pressure, eh? <laughs> I want to leave you with this. You'll be good. Have you got any slides you want to share some I do, interest? I do have really short slides just to keep me on time, so I don't nutter longer than what you've assigned to me. Okay, well, you've got, you should have the um, ability to screen share now, so. Yeah. I'll catch you at 11. I'll go, in, I'll go into this thing just now and I'll catch you at 11. Okay, good man. Catch you soon. Take care, bye. I wonder if everybody could put themselves on mute would be very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, just um, while we're waiting for the to tick up, well, we're probably at the, the witching hour. Uh, so today. We have three guests joining us, Jason Mavich of Umbrella Training, who's going to talk to us about the latest um, developments in the apprenticeship world. Um, this is uh, National Apprenticeship Week, so it seemed very appropriate. Um, we have Chris Tarrant joining us, Chief Executive of BVA BDRC, who uh, I hope will give us an update on um, latest consumer sentiments and likely consumer behavior looking forward, particularly as it relates to the hospitality sector. And then we have Alex Robinson of STR, who will be joining us um, to give us the latest uh, hotel data based in a sort of global context and also is going to, I think, deliver one or two other um, interesting observations and suggestions of what might lay ahead for us all. So um, we've got a fairly packed agenda. <clears throat> so um, other than saying very nice to see you all and good morning and thank you very much for joining us once again. Um, I think if I may, I will hand over to Joe Simovich. Um, who is going to give us a brief walk through um, latest opportunities in relation to apprenticeship. So the, the floor is yours, Joe. so please crack on. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be back here again. I do have a lot to say. Some of the interesting things that are happening in the apprenticeship world and certainly in, in um, hospitality and apprenticeships world. Um, we've had white paper being delivered um, last week by Gavin Williamson that highlights some of the interesting movements in the skills agenda that, that are relevant to hospitality businesses. Um, and we have a National Apprenticeship Week. So without further ado, actually, Roddy, when I emailed you, I did say it was the ninth that I wanted to come in. But this is not a bad thing because actually I'm here to present that the, you know, the, the, the program that we have for National Apprenticeship Week, which starts on the 8th of February and finishes on 14th of February. So full seven days of absolutely amazing uh, um, things happening in the uh, apprenticeship world. Uh, this year's theme is Build the Future, a much nicer theme than last years I definitely didn't like last year's theme it was difficult to build around it and this year they want us to talk about how we train retain and achieve which is quite difficult in hospitality industry at the moment but uh, um, in the terms of retaining and, 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 and sort of marrying that with what's going on in the industry um, however we have built quite an interesting uh, um, agenda for this week uh, celebrating um, friendships and part of that agenda focuses on really highlighting to build the, um, um, sorry could i just ask that people um mute themselves sorry jay to cut across you I, i'm trying to mute people as yep. we go here but there are obviously one or two people who are unmuted so just give me a moment and i'll try and mute them all for you um, but a lot of carry on I'm trying to work out who's not muted. Could everybody perhaps mute themselves there? Jump up. Um, I jump up. Jump. Uh, uh, might be Nazim. Right, Nazim is now muted. Right, you should be good to go, Joe. That is brilliant. So, um, as mentioned. 
before uh, um, in the National Apprenticeship Week, we, we will be talking about funding opportunities um, for the apprenticeships. We have quite a lot of our business partners starting apprenticeships despite people being on furlough and preparing them for sort of April, May um, reopenings that they're planning, you know, um, hopefully everything will, will go that way. Um, but the, the two things that I would like to highlight for you um, is a celebrate National Apprenticeship Week if you do have apprentices in your um, in your businesses because they're still uh, able to train and continue their development whilst on furlough if they are there. And then uh, on the 9th of February, I would like to draw your attention to the Transfers Roundtable, which is going to be uh, run by Umbrella Training. And uh, we have Sodexo, Compass, London Progression Collaboration, um, Luxury Family Hotels, and GlaxoSmithKline uh, joining together to talk about how to transfer levy funds from um, larger businesses that have unspent levy funds to the smaller businesses that don't have levy to actually train and develop their people. So if you're in a position where you don't have levy to support your people agenda, join this uh, uh, um, round table. It's all on the Umbrella Training website uh, um, and you can easily join us. I think this is going to be a LinkedIn Live. So if you're also linking with me, you will be able to see this through LinkedIn Live. And I also want to point out that on the Friday, the 12th of February, we're going to have an employer case studies discussed with homegrown hotels, PPHE and Farncom Estates. All three of these groups have actually had um, new groups of apprentices starting on a supervisory and management level, as well as chef level during the the first and, and, and now during the third lockdown. So they're still training, they're still using their apprenticeship levy and developing people for the future. So something to, to think about. So National Apprenticeship Week next week, 8th of um, February till the 14th of February. Um, umbrella training, we also have devised something called No More Banana Bread. Um, so you've done all the banana bread you've done all the Netflix, you've done all of the things, you know, sourdough and everything else. Chefs, I have nothing against people learning how to do this. However, um, what we've built is a 12 week program to really that anyone can access in hospitality. So if you're struggling with engaging your teams or if you want to provide them with a structured development program for 12 weeks, um, we have these bite-sized chunks of, of, of development um, di divided into 12 themes. Some of the themes are really relevant, for example, relationships or problem solving or finance, um, and they're individual and organizational. So it, it focuses on supportive hospitality businesses, but also individuals. Um, and on Mondays, we have Mr. Motivator, uh, the, the 90s icon, sort of fitness icon, actually motivating hospitality and, and, and sort of getting people into a, some sort of a fitness routine. So Harry, Michael, I know that you're gonna love this and join us on these, you know, on these Mondays. Um, Try Tuesday is um, come and sort of join a training session with some of our consultants. So we have Hilary Cook, Dr. Hilary Cook and Rachel Begby, uh, FIH, joining us for these Wisdom Wednesday is when some of um, hospitality superheroes will be sharing their wisdom. Apprentices take over on Thursday, tell you a little bit more about apprenticeships and the topic of the week. And then we have Famous and Fabulous Friday. Now, what I want to remind you is this week is the equality, the racial equality week. And this week we have amazing Lorraine Coops from um, uh, I want to say be inclusive hospitality yes be inclusive hospitality talking about the importance of racial equality so join us for that and all of this is available mainly on linkedin live and instagram live so it's very sort of um i suppose accessible rather than zoom based and webinar based because we wanted to stay away from that so that's some content for you guys in the terms of skills development in the next 12 weeks that hopefully helps I know that mastering holders are having an amazing program that is a 12 week program for that is focused on, on, on management and leadership. So if you haven't seen that, please, please do have a look and share with your teams. Lastly, uh, um, you know, because I have to put in the, in the next gear, I know Rod is giving me 10 minutes to, to, to fit in everything. Um, last week, early last week, there was a white paper um, that was published by Gavin Williamson that outlines the um, skills for jobs um, agenda um, of the government and it's a lifelong learning for opportunity and growth 
Um, it's an interesting white paper. It reminds me of a 2006, 2007 white paper, but they all look alike and they all go in cycles. What's really important for you to, to note is the, the following aspects of the paper. Um, there are some upsetting aspects of the paper that I'll talk about in, in relation to hospitality, but these are the important aspects for you as business owners and, and, and leaders in the industry. Um, the, the focus for this is creating local skills and improvement plans um, and college business centers. So as part of your, your local skills agenda, it will be really important that you actually be part, are part of a chamber of commerce because all of this will be led by chamber, chambers of commerce. So if you do want to be building the skills agenda for hospitality, um, it can't be people like me from the provider side doing that. It has to be led by employers. And in essence, the idea is that uh, the employers are setting out a credibly articulated and evidence-based assessment of skills needs to which providers will be empowered to respond. So I need to signpost you to the local chamber of commerce as soon as possible to be part of this local skills improvement plans, because what we're seeing is a lot of focus on digital, not a lot of focus on hospitality to a point where DfE is implementing a flexible lifelong loan entitlements from 2025, but also they're looking at some starting in 2022 and hospitality level three is not on the list. So unless you have levy or a levy transfer, there is no route for people to train hospitality apprenticeships because they are, as, as they're highlighting in the paper, uh, they're not economically viable. So we need to push our chambers of commerce to, to make sure that this changes. Um, basically, the idea is that DFE's intention is to legislate to put employer leadership of local skills and improvement plans. We can only do that if we know that we need to do that. So please share as much as you can uh, um, with your industry that they need to be getting into in touch with their chamber of commerce and saying what they need for hospitality and and lastly a good thing of of the web in, in the white paper is that that there is um emphasis and central role for employers to design technical courses including level four and five now this has happened at the chef level two this has happened at the hospitality team member level two and three to a point um, but we haven't had the emphasis on operational uh, uh, manager level five, um, which is a generic qualification or hospitality manager level four in its in, in as much as detail as we have have had with chef qualification. So, so fingers crossed, this will make a difference to what we can do to support future leaders in in um, in hospitality so that's it for me roddy in in essence three calls for action celebrate national apprenticeship week as much as you can um join our celebration and umbrella training if you want to hear about transfers and um employer case studies um, come and and learn something and don't do any more banana bread but do something that is relevant for your mental uh, um, agility and 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 strength to come back into the business and certainly share that with your um, teams because it's going to be experts from the industry for the industry sharing knowledge and and get in touch with your local chamber of commerce because you could be in the driving seat and if we're not we might lose out on on some really um, relevant um, training so that's it for me Joe, thank you very much indeed. Um, very helpful. I'm sorry I had to squeeze you into a short time, a short time window. Um, I will circulate information about all of that with the follow-up email. But for the for the meantime, Joe, thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm now going to turn, <clears throat> excuse me, to um, Chris Tarrant, who is Chief Executive of BVA BDRC. Chris has been a regular contributor to, uh, contributor, sorry, to these sessions. Um, as I'm sure you all know, BVA BDRC um, are a research house, amongst other things, and monitor consumer attitudes and consumer behavior, particularly as they relate to the hospitality industry. And Chris's um, insights have been, I think, very well received by our, our group in the past. So, Chris, if I may, I will hand the baton to you and um, please do give us an update on what the latest state of play is. Uh, where's Chris? He was there a minute ago. I saw him. Are you on mute, Chris? 
Where's Chris? Hello, Chris, come in. Wait a minute. Let me see if I can find him. One second, Chris. Uh, he was here two minutes ago. He seems to have dropped off the call. Have you? Can you see me at all? Ah, I can hear you now. Sorry, we I couldn't hear you or see you, but I can now hear you, Chris. Okay, you can hear me, but you can't see me. You're saying? Ah, uh, well, others may be able to see you. Hold on, let me just. Um, let's give me a second. Chris, I can see him. I can see him, Roddy. Yeah, Chris, yep. you're there. Yep. Okay. Yep. Can you, okay. Can you see that, Chris? Apologies. Okay. Can, can people see the presentation? We can. On screen share. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Because uh, stranger. Yeah. I. Um, hopefully, this is going to go. I've, I've got the image only on a single screen, but. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you'll let me know if there's a problem with seeing or hearing me. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back. And um, as usual, I'm referring to the sources that um, I've uh, used in previous sessions, which is the BVA BDRC uh, series on ClearSight, looking at recovery in COVID-19. We have a fortnightly uh, online tracker um, of 1,750 adults. Um, and most of the data I'll be sharing was collected up to mid-January, but I do have some headlines uh, that are on new data up to the 29th of January, so that's up until last Friday, which is very important because consumer sentiment, frankly, has been all over the place uh, over the last six to eight weeks. Uh, I'll also draw in some of the information we have from the business sector, uh, from our business opinion omnibus, which, as a reminder, is the source platform for the Lloyds Bank uh, business uh, barometer. I'm now having trouble moving my slides on. Up oh, oh, there you go. Yep, that's worked. Okay. Um, when I say consumer <laughs> sentiment has been all over the place, uh, this sort of worm chart is one that um, we are updating from week to week in terms of asking people regarding the situation of coronavirus in the UK at the moment and the way it's going to change in the coming month, which of the following best describes your opinion? Um, and we have three options. The worst is still to come. Uh, things are going to stay the same, uh, or the worst has passed. And I last spoke to this group in uh, early December, and at that stage, we just had the first vaccine uh, was being announced, and consumer sentiment had become the most positive that it had been since um, the end of April, uh, and the, as we were coming out of the very first lockdown. So things were looking extremely promising the last time I was speaking to you, we then had the identification of the, um, the English or the Kent uh, strain of COVID and concerns um, about the, the latest, or the third wave of the lockdown, really the second wave was just um, a small cull on the way up to the summit uh, of the current wave. Um, clearly the number of people being infected and the level of hospitalizations started to go up significantly. So that uh, a wave that took place literally in Christmas week um, when we had the news of the latest lockdown, uh, Christmas was suddenly off. Opinion moved very, very negative. Uh, the worst is still to come rose to uh, 61%. And in the first uh, couple of weeks in January, so the first wave we had in January, it was still at a very high level, which is why I'm very pleased. I do have the data uh, from the wave that was conducted last week, the 25th to the 29th of January, as suddenly, with the mass vaccination program coming in, uh, we seem to see that sentiment again is improving. And in fact, is very similar to where it was um, in early December when the first, not so long after the first vaccine uh, was announced um, and uh, was starting to be deployed. Uh, so it has been quite a roller coaster in terms of consumer sentiment. That said, uh, the population, they can't be accused of wearing rose tinted glasses expected lead time to normality are actually continuing to extend. So that is a difference from when the first vaccine was announced. If you look at the chart on the left-hand side, this is the average number of months across our entire sample 
before normality will return. And um, in the run up to Christmas, it was down to about eight, eight to nine months, is what people were saying, from where we are now. It's worsened since then, and it stayed at that level. So I think we actually have an interesting change. Sentiment is improving, but increasingly, it seems to be this is about learning to live with the virus uh, rather than in terms of seeing the end of it. So there is a change. And if you look at the two bars on the right hand side, the position at the end of November that I was able to report to this group uh, in, in the first week of December, the most commonly mentioned time for when things would get back to normal was in quarter two of 2021. So 35% of people thought we'd be back to something close to normal uh, in the quarter after Easter. In the most recent data, so collected last week, even though sentiment has improved, normality is not expected to return for a long time yet. So the most common mention is now actually 2022 or later before we get back to normal. So I think this is really quite an important mindset change uh, for UK consumers, which is the virus is not going away. We're not going to get back to normal, but we can live with it. And clearly, vaccination seems to be the key to living with the virus. And enthusiasm for the uh, program has risen markedly in the last two months. Uh, so this represents growing confidence about people who perhaps initially had some concern about side effects. So when we first collected this data at the end of November, we had 42% who said they, I will try to have the vaccine as soon as I possibly can. That has risen markedly to 61%. And if you look at the right-hand end of the chart, we actually have 7% of the sample we've spoken to who've told us they have already had the vaccine. Uh, so we're into a position in which we have suddenly become vaccine acceptors, as all the other categories have reduced um, uh, quite significantly over this period of time. So it seems that the vaccination program is the game changer. Um, and the rollout of this mass, mass vaccination program perhaps makes for a rare clear policy success. And from an all time low, this is increasing confidence in how the government is handling the crisis. So in the week in the run up to Christmas in which the rules seem to be changing every 24 hours, confidence in the government was at only 37%. It has recovered nearly 10 points since then, but clearly is a long way off where it was at the start of the pan pandemic when everyone was buckling down together. But the vaccination does seem to offer uh, the route out towards living with the virus. Now, we've been monitoring levels of participation in key sectors to track the extent of recovery and, of course, setback uh, when that uh, has happened. And this is an update on a chart that um, I have shown before. So looking at the incidence of holiday and accommodation booking. And clearly, uh, after the, uh, the autumn recovery uh, was uh, uh, choked off, as we had the development of the second wave of the virus. Lockdown two dramatically impacted that. Uh, the break between lockdown two, which obviously was England specific on the dates I got here, and lockdown three wasn't very much, so there was very limited recovery in that time. But what we are seeing is that in January, people are making longer term plans uh, rather than short term plans. And I think that's evident in the uptick for UK holiday bookings. So it's the time to push summer bookings. We asked people, when would they feel comfortable about booking a UK holiday? So the previous charts are sort of saying about summer bookings, well, there are some who say, as soon as the lockdown is over, they would consider booking a UK holiday. But it's only around one in eight um, of all consumers. Um, leaving it for a few weeks, a further one in eight, leaving it several months is about a quarter of the population. And similar proportions say not until either a significant proportion of the population has been vaccinated or they themselves and their family have been vaccinated. Hence that link back to the significance of vaccination uh, being the key to us getting back to something approaching uh, the type of behaviour that people would like to have. But there are some people who say that they would book as soon as the lockdown is over. And what I want to share with you is I don't have the time to go through it in detail this morning, but at BVA BDRC, we have developed a consumer segmentation, um, putting all consumers into one of six categories, which I'll say just a little bit more about these. 
But in the life goes on category, half of the people who are in that segment say they would make a booking as soon as the lockdown is over. So though most of the data I'm showing is for whole populations, it's very important to appreciate the power and the significance of looking at target consumer segments where you may get better response um, and uh, it's important to see how you can reach into those. So life goes on is a segment that say, as soon as the lockdown eases, half of them would be willing to book in the UK. Those who have less to lose, those who are protected but pragmatic are also ones that long-term in our segments, we have said are vaguely COVID confident and are more willing to contemplate uh, making uh, a UK holiday booking. So as I say, all consumers are assigned to one of the six segments, each with different attitudes towards COVID and also other factors. And those influence their intended and actual behavior. And now while there are variations by age and wealth across these segments, it's not uh, what they are defined by. Uh, so if we look at the right-hand one of these, um, so the life goes on type of principle, it's a small segment. So though I've said half of these people would be willing to make a booking straight away, it is our smallest segment, but they are clearly different uh, from the rest of the population. Uh, and they say protecting the economy should be the focus. Uh, on the whole, they are a reasonably comfortably well-off group. Uh, they also tend to be somewhat older, which is interesting. They, most of this group are aged over 25. Uh, so they're sort of established and confident people who in a sense can assess way up risks and will move on, on the basis of those. Uh, to activate them, it's through social media. Uh, there are also people who very much are looking for experiential type of offerings. Uh, the other group here that is of perhaps particular significance is less to lose because they make up 28% of the population. So uh, though their uh, propensity to book straight away is not as high, um, they are a large segment. And this is a, typically a younger age demographic. Most of these people are aged under 35. Uh, they will respond to both TV advertising, so that uh, can be uh, looking to push uh, Visit Scotland or, or whoever to uh, be back on the promotion trail, uh, but then in turn, they also will respond uh, to uh, social media. So understanding a little bit more about these segments, I don't have the time to do it here, but I just want to indicate uh, through the extent of variation on the data on that previous chart, how segmentation is a really important part of the marketing and business planning arsenal as we look to make the best, what clearly is going to be a challenging 2021. I'll wrap up with just a few charts looking at the mood of uh, UK businesses. And here the most recent data is up until mid-January. So we're about to go into field uh, this week uh, for the uh, February data collection. Um, and so though the data looks less promising by comparison with consumers, if you look at the same point in time, the figures are actually quite similar, with around 50% um, in mid-January saying the worst is still to come. Uh, and notice here, um, the businesses in Scotland we've spoken to, the worst is still to come is at a higher level of 62%. And that's a general picture. I'm, I'm saying this because I'm aware, Roddy, you have quite a lot of Scottish representatives who attend this call. And Scotland is having a rather more pessimistic outlook at the moment uh, than is England. Um, I would say to a certain extent, Northern Ireland also fits in uh, with that Scottish uh, view. Um, and uh, to make that point a little bit further, across the UK as a whole, the proportion of businesses confident in their company's ability to survive the crisis is one metric, uh, unlike others, that has barely altered in the last nine months that we've been collecting this data. So 68% of all businesses say they are confident that their business will survive. That has moved in a range contained between 66 and 70% over that time. So it's been really relatively stable. That is the national level, but there is variation at the regional level, such that London and the Southeast is being somewhat more optimistic than was the case in the past, uh, being counterbalanced in particular uh, by Scottish businesses, where we're now up to four in 10 of them saying they're not entirely certain about uh, the survivability of their businesses. So that ought to be of some concern uh, for Scotland as a, a local source market for those on the call in the area. Uh, and a final chart I'm going to share with you is looking 
asking businesses uh, in terms of which of the following applies to your business. That's having any UK travel for business, any overseas travel for business, uh, any hiring of venues for small business meetings. And rather than report the actual data, what I've taken here is for those who gave who said they did these things pre-COVID, I've used that as a 100 index and then looked at uh, what has happened to each of those travel segments um, since then. Um, and the forecast going forward clearly is the important element. So when asked this question in January 21, just one in three of the businesses that previously had had people traveling in the UK for business say they now have anybody doing that. So this is going to be the most uh, that business travel demand is at because it's saying that any of our people are traveling for business. It's not saying that they all are who previously were. We can see that the hardest hit of these segments is the hiring of venues, uh, so for meetings and events, is currently down at only 15% of the market is saying they are in any way active currently. We do see that demand is expected to recover from quarter two onwards, so that's businesses assessing what they know now, what they think will happen going further forwards, such that by the end of 2021, four out of five businesses think they will be back having people traveling for business in the UK. But it will only be a little over a three in five of those who think they'll be back hiring venues uh, for business in this time. So the meetings and events sector is set to recover more slowly than the general uh, transient business market. In fact, more slowly than overseas business travel, where that is relevant uh, for particular businesses. So Roddy, thank you very much. Uh, that's um, a run through in, in terms of some uh, UK consumer sentiment. And obviously I'll be happy to take uh, questions later on, but I know you have another presentation uh, to put on as well. Um, thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, very, very interesting uh, as per usual. Um, just one quick question, which has come in at this stage <clears throat> um, from Tanya Lister. Um, she asks, um, what I think is a quite an interesting question, are these figures being shared with the Scottish Government? Uh, they, the, sh the figures go to Visit Scotland uh, because they are one of the backers of this. So we have the, the national visit organisations are providing some of the basic funding for what is shown here. Um, there's no certainty that these are going to the Scottish Government. And as I say, I you have a lot of Scottish representatives here, and we are seeing something of a difference uh, between Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK um, on some of the data. It, it's less marked in terms of general consumers, uh, but there is a slight gap there as well. But it's on uh, in terms of businesses that we are seeing variation. And um, so some of the, the data I'm showing here is uh, some of the data that we collect. So it's available for anyone to download. And um, with the, the difficulty of getting started, I, I didn't remind people that it, you can register on our website and regular reports come out, which are freely available. Um, and we can run uh, specific analyses for anyone if they wish to have that. But obviously, there would be a, a data analysis charge for that. Sorry, that was a, a long answer to say I don't actually know, Roddy. <laughs> We might mention it to visit Scotland, suggest they might like to share it to the Scottish <laughs> Government. Um, listen, thank you very, very much um, for that, Chris. Um, if there are any other questions, please do just drop them into the chat box. And if there's time, I, I will come back to Chris. Um, and and I, I think you're quite happy for me to share those slides with the, the group, aren't you, Chris, on the basis that should they use any of the data, as long as they um, a credit you, you're, you're uh, uh, credit, not a credit, credit you, you're happy with that. Uh, uh, that. That's my request. I will send those through to you. And I would say for these sessions I run for you, you do get one or two charts that don't appear um, in the yes. regular reports. I always look to do something interesting and different for this group. Okay. You're, you're, you're worth it. Well, that's my, much appreciated. Thanks very much, Chris. Please, please don't run away in case there are um, any more questions. If you do have any questions for Chris, please just drop them in the chat box and uh, we will um, come back to them. Um, so finally for this morning, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Alex Robinson of STR. Um, as again, many of you will know, STR have been 
regular contributors to our, our sessions. Um, Alex is a newbie from our point of view, so welcome, Alex. Um, you, you, um, welcome to the lion's den. Um, please um, do give us your best insights. Um, I'm taking it you're there and you can hear me, and I'm assuming you probably want to share your screen as well, so you should have um, the ability to do that. Um, so can I now hand the baton to you, Alex? Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for welcoming me into the group. Uh, I will just say one caveat. If you do hear any large crashes or bangs, there is a giant skip outside my house, which much of my roof is going into at the moment. So I'm not in any peril, but just so it doesn't cause you any alarm. But one of the many twinges from working at home. But I thought to give you a reflective overview, starting with a global look and then down into European performance and landing into the UK. And for those of you that have been keenly following performance on a global level, these occupancies across continents and regions won't come as a great deal of surprise as China has indeed led the way back in terms of recovery. And what you can see there is the traditional STR occupancy, which is rooms sold into rooms available in the large green circles. With the advent of such mass closures during the pandemic, we also created a secondary metric called total room inventory. And that takes into account all rooms in the market, regardless of their status as open or closed. And what you can see there in China, the delta between 44, 49%, very slim, reflecting the fact that the market is very much open. And we'll touch briefly on the Middle East, some sizable performance there from a few key markets, North America, the US largely staying open, and some challenges that we've seen here in Europe, which I'm sure many of you are unfortunately familiar with. This takes us back to occupancy all the way from the beginning of last year, just before the pandemic. And you can see how China plunged much before our respective regions. And indeed, we enjoyed normal trading right the way through up until February or March. What is remarkable, as you can see there, if you follow that orange line all the way to the end, is that China is actually just about back to those levels that it saw at the beginning of last year, which is quite remarkable, especially when you contrast that with the performance you see across the other regions with Europe, unfortunately, being the recipient of the wooden spoon at this point in time. Zooming out now to December occupancies, an interesting to chart some resurgence and by far and away, China is still remaining the main narrative there. Sanya, which is particularly encouraging, is that's not just a domestic leisure destination, but one that's often reached by a two to three hour flight. So that does show some confidence for short haul travel. Singapore there, a beneficiary of quarantine demand, but by and large, it really is a case of domestic demand fueling those markets with the exception of Dubai. And I'm sure you've all seen the headlines in the papers about Britons in particular flocking to Dubai at the end of the year and stimulating that leisure demand. And that certainly is what we saw through December. If we take the same grouping of markets and look at this from a total rooms inventory perspective, so this now taking into account all hotels in the market, regardless of those being open or closed, you can see a few more entrants into the fray there. Abu Dhabi and Doha, two other Gulf markets, more being the beneficiaries of quarantine stays upon arrival. But again, you can see Dubai starting to climb the charts there. And with Dubai's resurgence in leisure performance, thought it'd be an interesting one to pause and take a brief look at. Here you can see occupancy in 2020 contrasted with that of 2019 and indeed a barren run for the summer months. And that's not atypical given the soaring temperatures that you would see there. But what is particularly remarkable, similar to what we saw in China as a whole, is you can see occupancy climbing almost level with what you would have expected in 2019. And when we look at forward data for Dubai, this taken forward occupancy on the books as of January 4th, right the way through to December, quite impressive that that pacing is actually not too far behind what you would have seen for the same time last year during normal trading. We do expect some of that to wash off the books. Obviously, you will have seen stricter quarantining procedures now in Dubai, UK placing a restriction there. So we do expect some of that momentum to fall away from the Dubai market. A huge topic of conversation and one referenced in the creation of total room inventory is the level of closures. Never before would we have seen 
are thinking that two out of every three rooms in Europe would be closed in April, May, and June. And that is indeed what we saw. But there was a, a moment for positive sentiment when we saw that domestic leisure really abound throughout the summer. And I'm sure many of you located in markets in Scotland, perhaps up in Inverness, more leisure markets down in Cornwall, really did see a, a huge benefit and perhaps even taking some of those staycations yourselves. We are starting to see an increase in the number of closures again, as unfortunately we've had to grapple with nationwide lockdowns, but we are seeing that hotels are indeed choosing to remain open where possible. And this led us to what I think is a particularly insightful trend. And what we can see here is using the example of the Edinburgh market, we chart the occupancy. Come on in, baby. We chart the occupancy of hotels that remained open before the July 15th reopening right the way through from beginning of June to the middle and then those that opened right at the lifting of lockdown and those thereafter. And what you can see is that those that remained open or were open before achieved higher occupancies that opened right as lockdown was lifted or thereafter. And a really interesting way to bring this to light is taking a look at the market penetration index. So what is a hotel achieving an occupancy relative in its fair share to the market? And if we look at four weeks out, this being in 2019, normal trading patterns, you can see quite a wide array of performance. And that reflects the different yielding strategies that certain properties will take as they approach day of arrival. But what you do see at the end in actualized performance, there is quite a narrow band of performance between 10 to 20 percentage points. However, if we then take a look at forward occupancies in August again for Edinburgh, but this time in 2020, you can see it's much more linear. So all of these green lines are those that took more than their fair share of their market penetration index, indexing above that of their comm sets. And by and large, where they started four weeks out is where they finished. Sure, there were a few outliers there towards the bottom, but by and large, a very left to right pattern. And the same goes for those that underperformed. Those that underperformed four weeks out, also moving closer to date of arrival and actualized performance ended up below. And if you put those two together, what we see is a band of performance of not 10 to 20% that we saw during normal trading times, but that of 70 to 80%. So it goes to show certainly a case for remaining open where possible. And I know many hoteliers, it is a conversation that, is a challenging one internally and many different viewpoints, but there is a case to be said for maintaining that touch point with your guest, staying open. So it is a familiar point when you reopen and you can see reinforced there that those that did indeed remain open were able to achieve better than those who opened just when lockdown was lifted or thereafter. If we then move to Europe, looking at a range of markets similar to what we saw for the global perspective, looking at some of those Chinese markets that took the leaderboard, again, looking at occupancy for December, as we can see, it is a case of domestic demand across the board. Positive to see a number of Scottish and English markets there. Interestingly, similar to the case of Dubai, you can see two Turkish markets there, again, benefiting from a slightly more less stringent view of quarantine for arrival. And if we look at that, on a total room inventory basis, this being for all hotels in the market, not just those that were open, we can see them climbing up. But the secret source really being present in Exeter, as we can see there, perhaps uh, a pathway for those making their way out to Cornwall, as you can see. Looking back on UK occupancies and what we experienced during the various lockdowns, we can see that rise buoyed by domestic leisure that we saw in the summer. And I think all of us, myself included, were really hoping for a more open Christmas, not just for family, but also for the industry. And we all know, unfortunately, that those lockdowns were enacted. And that is reflected in occupancies there really coming to a halt. And New Year's Eve, which is usually a, a massive day for our industry with occupancies of just 14 percent across the UK. So really effectively closed for business. And when we take a look at ADR, December was also unfortunately the recipient of ADR declines of really the greatest that we saw since June, ranging from anywhere from 34 to 44%. And if we take those together and put those into the equation to 
get RevPAR, we can see declines. And this year is looking at daily throughout December of anywhere from 60 to even as harrowing as 91%. And I think it it does show just quite how sobering those figures are across the UK and the impact of, of lockdowns and what it means in terms of putting a halt on any demand. One analysis to conduct that we thought would be of interest is looking at relative markets and how they perform based on which tier of restriction they'd been assigned. We thought perhaps there'd be a correlation where those with more lenient tiers would rise higher and those with more strict tiers would fall to the bottom. But interestingly, if you look at Oxford, one of the leading markets with an occupancy of 34% in December, also joined by the likes of Cambridge and Southampton in the strictest tier, tier four, actually towards the top end of the spectrum. So not much of an apparent correlation. Yes, you could say Inverness and tier one was a market that benefited, but not even achieving that of Oxford. So interesting to be seen that there wasn't as widespread a correlation with the tier restrictions. One trend that we did see was the regions outpacing that of London. And that's a trend that we saw across the globe with domestic leisure destinations outperforming those major metropolitan markets that have a larger reliance on international airlift. Unfortunately, what we did see with the advent of the lockdown in December is that the regions were reined back in to that performance with London. So any performance boost or differentiation they were seeing versus a more metropolitan international market was eroded with that lockdown. One trend that did remain across the board, and that's in the UK and also globally, is that the lower end of the class or ADR classified properties outperforming those at the higher end. So your economy and mid-scale properties outperforming those of luxury. Also a nod to extended stay service departments also performing very well, all things considered relative to the market as well. So if we reflect back on 2020, and here we can see the year to date occupancies, it does make for difficult reading indeed. And I think 2020 will be a year that we reflect on realizing perhaps how fortunate we are when trading resumes, but not one that will lament as far as the times that we experienced and the occupancies that we saw. And you can see there with a occupancy overall across the UK of 40%, certainly not what we would have envisaged making forecasts back in January of 2020. And if we then look at occupancies for the first weeks to the start of 2021, it does make for challenging reading indeed. A number of markets below 20%, you can see Belfast, Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dublin and London amongst those Aberdeen and Plymouth being those best of a otherwise not particularly encouraging bunch. And if we look ahead to future data, this taking London and Edinburgh and contrasting across a range of European markets, it is a shared struggle, both with ourselves and hoteliers on the continent, not a great deal of business on the books through to April, but some signs of optimism there. And you can see Edinburgh, any rugby fans looking forward, not just to the Six Nations, but also to the Lions hosting Japan in July, as well as the UN Climate Summit in November. So it does show that there is some positive momentum to be had there. But if you look outside of those months, it is indeed a very flat and, and dull ocean of demand at this moment in time. And we have been forecasting the recovery since March of last year, and it's largely remained unchanged. If we think about the return of domestic leisure, we are expecting to see that again this summer. And we see encouraging figures around the vaccine, as many as 9 million Britons being vaccinated at this point, half of those over 70 by the end of January, and hoping that that momentum does indeed continue. But even with that, when you talk about drivers such as corporate, mice, meeting and events, we do think those are going to be not only under pressure because of health concerns, certainly this year, but also the economic impact of the pandemic, companies having more scrutiny on expenditure, airlines also having limited capacity, which means the limited capacity there is being at a higher price and perhaps stifling some of that demand. So all of those things pointing to a full recovery in 2024. But that said, not to say that we couldn't see quicker recoveries in the regions, perhaps those markets and domestic leisure really being the first to 
to lead us into the fray, but encouraging signs to see, but no illusions that it will be a, a long trodden road ahead. But that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you again very much for welcoming me this morning and happy to, to answer any questions or also very interested to hear any anecdotal thoughts or different commentary on those that are operating across the UK. Alex, thank you very much indeed. Um, I've, I've participated in a number of the STR webinars uh, and interesting to see some sort of new angles and, and particularly looking forward, um, perhaps a bit more than some of the ones I've attended. Um, you know, some, some encouragement there. Um, a question here um, from Robert Holland, who asks, um, could you please ask Alex about the Caribbean? I understand that it's pretty much COVID free, but it's rarely mentioned in the statistics. Is this because you don't have sufficient market data? I'd have to take a further look at the Caribbean markets off to hand. I, I wouldn't be able to call out their performance, but I do see anecdotally that a lot of leisure guests have been staying there even for extended stays. So I wouldn't be surprised if that performance was quite strong seeing a number of destinations head there, but unfortunately don't have the, the numbers to hand in terms of Caribbean performance, but we certainly have, have sample in that region. Okay, good. Um, Gary Atkinson just makes the comment that just as an update um, regarding Aberdeen's occupants, and I have to say I'm slightly surprised by seeing where Aberdeen was sitting. Um, it is, of course, swayed with high usage of airport hotels for the offshore industry, which is still open for business. Um, city centre properties, he says, are not achieving such positive occupancies. So I think that is a, a I can absolutely understand that that's a, a glitch caused by the offshore, um, the offshore industry. Um, your statistics and observations regarding the performance of businesses which remain open and their ability to perform in a more robust manner once able to do so are pretty interesting because uh, I've been part of many discussions about should we keep this hotel open or should we close this hotel uh, and what what seems to be the case is you, you need to be open to to get the business I mean can you comment any further on that Alex? I think it is a really challenging conversation especially as the waves of lockdown come for those that reopen then you have the consideration of do you then close again but from speaking to a range of operators I think those that are resoundingly looking to remain closed are the larger conference hotels, you know, several hundred bedrooms, those that would really see their occupancy gains from large events, especially those in city center. And then I think on the other end of the spectrum, you have you know, smaller independent properties, 15, 30 bedrooms in leisure destinations where they're booked through the roof. So I think it is a tale of, of which market you're in. But I think hospitality has always been a very resilient industry with so many different things coming to the fore, whether it be Airbnb, new technology, OTAs, and, and cost preservation. I think hoteliers, where possible, have looked to, to stay open on as, as nimble and agile cost as they can, is, is what we have seen. And, and again, this probably isn't something you track, but being as close to the market as you are, I suspect you've got a bit of a, a feel. Um, clearly, the OTAs have, have suffered um, along with the rest of the industry over the last, um, you know, the last year or so. Uh, and there, there seems to be um, a trend, which is that as business is returning, more of that is going direct rather than through the OTA. So have you got any sense of what the OTA world is like, how it's likely to develop and, and how whether the OTAs have sort of... Um, gone backwards as a, as a long-term um, result of COVID or do you see them bouncing back? I think it's a very interesting dynamic. Before uh, working for STR, I worked for Expedia for a number of years in the US and I, a lot of those dynamics are, are certainly changing in terms of the way the inventory is assessed as well as margins. I think if you look on the whole, you know, margins certainly seem to be coming down from what they were certainly when I was working with hotels back in 2010 and, and so forth. So that is a, a dynamic that's changing, but also as that changes your know, Expedia silening 
an agreement with Marriott to be the preferential wholesaler as well. I think there's a sense of more cooperation. That said, you know, in terms of market share, during the global financial crisis, we actually saw incredible market share. It was really a, a leisure channel that was was really booming and, and giving a great deal of demand to hoteliers. But I'll be very interested to hear if that's something that changes as we uh, emerge from this. I think the scale of absence of demand that we've seen is really unlike any downturn that we've seen before. And ultimately, uh, you know, a, a tide that goes out to sea really leaves all boats on the sand uh, on the sandbar. And I think OTAs are are no different from that. So I think an opportunity for more cooperation is is certainly present and, and hopefully that's one that, that takes shape. Um, thanks, Alex. There's an interesting question here from Ed Herring who says, do you know what percentage of the hoteliers on today's call are open? Um, I'm, I'm afraid I don't, Ed, but it's a, an interesting question. If anybody anecdotally would like to just pop something into the chat box to say whether you're open or closed or what your plans are, um, might be interesting just to, to, to get a reaction. Um, it, Clearly, Ed, the the, <clears throat> the the staycation market is expected um, to bounce back um, massively in the UK as and when restrictions are lifted and people can start moving around. Um, is that pattern likely to be repeated in other countries across Europe and indeed across the globe? We saw that very much throughout last summer. If you looked to uh, Germany, for example, all of the northern coastline with beach access or if you look to France down to the south into Provence was very much the case the US as well any seaside resorts in China people uh, flying domestically even to Sanya two or three hours from Beijing so I think that's something that will continue and also with a renewed confidence if the vaccine vaccination levels reach what they do so I think performance could be could be even more encouraging I think the true test of recovery next year in Q3 and Q4 will be, what does it mean for domestic business travel and short haul? I think that will be the, the real test of our recovery later this year. And have you got any insight or, or what does your crystal ball tell you in terms of what that might look like? Well, I think short haul we could certainly see, but the cooperation between countries will be a challenge. We saw Spain open up last year and then we saw the effects in Barcelona and really the sheer volume of cases and obviously Spain declaring a state of emergency for six months. But then if you look up to the Baltics, for example, creating a travel bubble between Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. So I think it really depends on, on countries and, and how they cooperate together. You know, the UK, I think we're so fortunate here to be so far ahead in the vaccine, only really Israel and the UAE being ahead from a percentage inoculation standpoint. So I. I hope to see. I'm I'm supposed to be married in Argentina in November, so I'm my crystal ball is looking a bit cloudy at the moment. So I, I don't know. Probably put too much personal skin in the game. I, I hope so, but Argentina is a, a different cuddle of fish altogether. I think. Well, you, we we certainly wish you well with that. Um, here's a quick straw poll of hotels which are open or closed. Um, Ed Herring says we are closed. I'm not quite sure where some of these hotels are. Linda Redman, I think that's the Southwest, closed till lockdown ends. Sally Beck at the Royal Lancaster in London. The Royal Lancaster is open and we intend to stay open. We lose less by staying open. Willie Wood, um, who's a small country hotel down near Largs on the west coast of Scotland. We are open. Um, Graham Wason, I have a self-catering business which is closed for regular visitors but open for essential workers. I'm not quite sure which part of the world you're in, Graham, but I think down south. Um, Murray Lamont uh, up in Wick, in the northeast of Scotland. Macy's Hotel, Wick closed, um, opens next week. Interesting. Um, Paul Callingham to everybody. All of our 21 mainly provincial hotels are open with differing levels of success, approximately 22% occupancy last month. Jill Chalmers from Glenapp Castle, closed till Easter at least. Harry Murray at Lucknow Park, closed until lockdown um, is lifted. Um, Lynn Hood for Focus, Focus Hotels all open apart from one. Paul Milson, our hotels, this is um, in East Anglia, all hotels are closed until lockdown ends. 
Uh, Tanya Lister at Kalski in West Coast of Scotland, closed until lockdown is lifted. Almost all tourism related here. Um, so no business for key work from key workers. Um, what else we got? Ray Grant, this is King Craig Castle up on the east coast of Scotland. We're closed and have been planning to reopen on the 1st of March. However, with latest developments, we're anticipating having to re remain closed until the end of April. Um, Nicholas says, working with 13 hotels at the moment, two of which are open, Humber Royal and Staying Cool are open. Um, Body Whiteford, Feversham Arms closed, unlikely to open till Easter. Um, and he has a business called Hotel Phone. And he says 95% of his clients are closed. Um, James Page, Wentbridge House closed until lockdown ends. Um, George Kane closed until lockdown ends. Just some key event takeaways, such as Valentine's and Mother's Day. Um, Graham Wason's self-catering was indeed in Somerset. Um, Colin Thompson, Castle Hotel and Dorneth closed. Kevin Charity, uh, all 18 sites closed until lockdown ends. Um, so it would seem the majority are closed, but, but um, there are still quite a number open. And indeed, of the hotels that we operate, um, the majority are open, but they're in locations where essential workers um, do but I, I think the underlying message is if you can afford to stay open, you're probably going to recover more quickly as, as you come out the other end. Um, Alex, thank you so much. Um, we, we all have our fingers crossed that you managed to get married in Argentina. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure um, the fates will shine on you, hopefully kindly. But listen, thank you so much for your insights. Um, it's been really interesting, and I hope you um, might be tempted to come back and, and talk to us again at some stage in a few weeks, perhaps once um, the next round of data comes in. Um, equally to Chris, thank you so much, Chris, for your um, insights once again and your input. Um, always fascinating. Um, and um, finally to Jo, if she's with us, Jo, thank you again for, for your um, input and good luck with National Apprentice Week. Um, so we, we will circulate the slides from today to everybody. There are a couple of other um, things which I'm going to be circulating as well. Um, there is, um, let me just see if I can find it here. Um, there's a, something coming out on the Six Nations charity um, event. Um, which one of our members is keen to um, promote to you also will circulate that. There's um, the Royal Bank of Scotland is hosting a series of fraud awareness webinars. There's been a massive increase apparently in fraud um, and they do recommend that everybody um, attends one of these webinars. So I will circulate that. And there is also an update from Sonia Campbell at Mishkondorea um, regarding the latest developments in the um, insurance world. Um, and the successes which, or the further successes which um, they're enjoying. I know there are quite a lot of people on the call who um, have insurance policies with NFU Mutual um, and I think with Zuri, um, neither of whom are really playing ball. If you happen to be in that camp, I would urgently suggest that you get hold of Sonia Campbell at Mishkondorea. Um, they're looking at um, launching another action and um, I think they're looking for parties to, to wind into that action. If anybody wants to know how to get hold of Sonia Campbell, um, please just, that, that may not know, Sonia is a partner at Mishkon de Rea and led the class action on behalf of the um, hospitality sector against the insurance sector and, and got the, um, the, the right judgment in the Supreme Court. So that's it um, from me. Next week we have, um, if you uh, just give me one second, next week we have our guests are uh, Aggie from Hot Stats who will be giving us an update. Um, and we have Philippa Goldstein from, um, who is senior analyst and head of hotel research at, oh my goodness, I'm sorry, CBRE, I think. Um, anyway, Apologies if it's not, Philippa. Um, but um, we will look not, forward to welcoming you next week. 
No, Frank, is it? My, my apologies, Philippa, if you're on the call. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. Um, so Philippa, who's senior analyst from Knight Frank, will be joining us as well. Um, thank you to all our presenters. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And I um, hope you all have a good week and stay safe. And we'll look forward to welcoming you back next Tuesday. All the very best. Take care. Thank you, Roddy. Great pleasure. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you, Roddy. Bye-bye. Thanks, Roddy. Pleasure, Billy. Thank you very much, Roddy. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Not at all, Murray. All the very best. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you, Roddy. Pleasure all. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed for joining. Thank you. Great pleasure, Harry. Lovely to see you. You too. Mr. Patty, how are you? Nick? Can you hear me, Nick? Nick, can you hear me? Nick? Nick? Nick, can you hear me? Nick, can you hear me? <laughs>